Right, good evening everyone. Thank you very much for attending. Um, this is our first uh, Leicester area webinar, so um, hope it uh, hope you enjoy it. Um, just a few admin things. Um, throughout the presentation, you can um, write any questions you have in the Q and A box to the right hand side of your screen. And then at the end of the presentation, I will read them out for you. So feel free to type them in there. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Neville Rebello, and he he is from he's a research fellow at the Gas Turbine and Transmissions Research Centre at Nottingham University, and he will give a proper introduction about his background and everything. So. If you're ready, Neville, then uh, please um, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. Uh, and uh, thank. Uh, good evening to everyone, and welcome to this talk. Uh, so I'll be speaking today on uh, the topic of using cryogenic liquids and especially trying to thermodynamically exploit them for energy systems applications. And to be uh, give you a background, I did this work as a part of my PhD research at Loughborough University, which, uh, for which I was awarded a doctorate last year. So just to tell you a little about me, I, I'm currently a research fellow at the University of Nottingham. Prior to that, I was awarded a PhD by Loughborough University, and the title of my PhD was Evaporative Heat Transfer to Liquid Nitrogen for Energy Systems Applications. Prior to that, I worked for three years in a cryogenic engineering company in India, and I have a B.Eng. in mechanical engineering and an M.Tech. in cryogenic engineering. So without further ado, let me go to the presentation outline, and I will briefly, what I'm going to cover today is uh, the background, the reason why we uh, have interest in cryogenic liquids, uh, the motivation behind me pursuing this as a study or a topic of research, the objectives that I derive from basically the current uh, lacuna or the shortcomings that I found in literature, what was the methodology I adopted, followed by major results and some key conclusions. So let, us, let me first start and give you a background on why we need to reduce emissions. I'm sure everybody over here would agree with me and uh, but that we need to reduce emissions and try and make our planet a better place to, to live on. But let us just look at some of the stats. So a report done by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has stated that during the last four decades, there have been a 90% increase in CO2 emission. And these were the figures that they put in the year 2014. And uh, during this year, the International Energy Agency also found that the CO2 emissions were as high as 32 gigatons. However, the good thing was that they did not, they remained unchanged when compared to the previous year. And later on in 2015, we all have heard of the Paris Accord, which was signed by uh, almost 195 governments to limit, which pledged to limit global warming uh, at an average of no more than two degrees Celsius and this is relative to pre-industrial levels, this Paris Accord uh, should come into force and, uh, enforced uh, from this year onwards. And uh, when you look at the current pandemic scenario that we are facing, we have some, uh, some uh, advantages we, which we can gain. Uh, the recent report by the International Energy Agency suggests that there'll be an 8% uh, year-on-year -year decline in global CO2 emissions, and which states that they would, we would have emissions, uh, this rate of emissions would be similar to what we had 10 years ago, which is a good sign uh, for our environment. On the right-hand side, let's look at the UK emission scenario, and this is data stated by the government, so it's easily available. Uh, what we see is it's a, it's a good story, and the government is ensuring that we have emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, of which CO2 is the major contributor. So we have been gradually reducing our emissions, uh, and the figures show that 
uh, even up to 2017, which were the latest figures which were published, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and CO2 emissions were reduced by 3%. Uh, transport is one sector where the U UK would need to do more because transportation seems to be unchanged in terms of their greenhouse gas emissions. So now let's come to why is there an interest in cryogenic liquids? Uh, let me just start by defining what is cryogenics. And cryogenics is the study of low temperature phenomenon which occurs below minus 156 degrees Celsius, or if you want to state it in Kelvin, 123 Kelvin. The reason why uh, we have fixed or uh, the cryogenic society has fixed this uh, temperature is because most all of the cryogens liquefy below this temperature. So anything above this would come in the realm of refrigeration. When we talk about cryogenic liquids, and uh, we, we mostly speak about liquid nitrogen, because firstly, it's because it's the most abundant. Secondly, it's, uh, it's, a, it's the everywhere around us. It's, uh, we've got 79% almost of it in, by percent of volume in the air around us. It's an energy carrier with zero emissions. It's got an available energy of 743 kilojoules per kg. So that means there is some stored energy content in there which can be utilized. How does it compare with other sources which are currently used? So when we compare it with compressed hydrogen, we see that hydrogen has 180 times more energy content petrol and diesel easily outshine it, so does LNG. And when we compare it with the current energy density of lithium ion batteries, it seems more, more or less competitive. So there is a opportunity to extract this coal because usually the demand for nitrogen is the gas. But however, we liquefy and transport it because we can uh, transport and store larger quantities and it's more efficient. So when we try to uh, regasify it, we usually tend to lose a lot of this coal. So there's a, there is, exists a major challenge. There is an opportunity, but there is a major challenge in extracting this uh, stored energy in LN2 without any external losses. Now, when we are in the scenario of the COVID ongoing pandemic, uh, this has resulted in an increased demand. If I can just uh, cite some reports here, which uh, suggest that the demand for medical oxygen would increase uh, two to three times globally. So oxygen we know is produced from air by cryogenic distillation. There are other methods as well, but if you want to produce bulk oxygen, you would use cryogenic distillation. And hence, you would always have some additional liquefied nitrogen being produced as the, the byproduct. And so we have, we would have an opportunity where we would have more of this coal available to us, and we would just be wasting it if we let it go. So there, are, there have been primarily two uh, kind of systems used to extract this coal. Uh, one was we can call it like an indirect injection method, wherein you, you have liquid nitrogen and you use it in an external heat exchanger so that you can heat it up and pressurize it. to, uh, to So you produce pressurized gaseous nitrogen and then you use this pressurized ga gaseous nitrogen and expand it either in an engine, piston engine or in a turbine. And uh, this system has been trialed. One of the pro challenges with this system is you need high costs are involved because you need to buy, also buy bulky equipment. And this all this additional uh, piping and uh, all these inter, intermediate equipments lead to some uh, to quite a lot of losses. So the utilization of the entire cryogenic available energy is not possible. The second method is the direct injection method, wherein you directly inject uh, liquid nitrogen in an engine or in a piston uh, driven system where you then contact it with a hot fluid or relatively hotter fluid 
and uh, the the thing is that then you can directly utilize all the code uh, at the required point. Now the DI approach is resulting in a greater utilization of cryogenic energy. However, it requires a faster evaporation, which is a challenge. Before I go further, let me give you uh, the evolution of the cryogenic engine and uh, some of the uh, literatures that I've cited here are the, the major ones which were published and uh, there might be more. However, these were the ones which were more prominent and published. So the, the liquid air engine was first patented in uh, way back in 1900. And uh, for many years then, or many decades, you can say, up to the end of the century, you had no, almost no work, published work on these engines. Before the University of North Texas developed a car which could, had a storage tank of uh, 180 liters and it gave a range of 15 miles. Uh, then again, there was a pause in research. And uh, later on, it was more uh, from America, the shift moved more towards the UK. And uh, re research was done, especially here, I would note in the year 2011, where research was done on a novel cryogenic engine. And this engine cycle was based on, uh, on a concept known as the Dearman cycle. So what this uh, research produced is it led to the, uh, led to the spin-off and led to development of companies like German and Highview Power. So both these companies are startup companies in the UK which aim to extract this uh, the energy in cryogenic liquids. So all the above uh, research and all the above uh, the cars developed that I've sp spoken about use the, the indirect approach for evaporating the liquid. And although there was some research tried by Clark on the DI approach, it was always met with limited success. So uh, the challenge here, and this is what led me to the, to the, gave me the motivation to pursue what I finally pursued is why can we improve uh, the DI approach? And uh, the answer to that was yes. However, we needed to evaporate this uh, the cryogenic liquid at a faster rate. That means a higher heat transfer rate. So what we had to first do is look at literature of a simplistic way of studying this. And this was experiments where uh, there were a number of uh, people who did experiments where they had a tank or a, a sealed tank of water mostly, and they injected a jet of cryogenic liquid, some cases helium, some cases uh, nitrogen, and what they all did is they ha measured the pressure rise. So as you can see in this, uh, if you can look at the sixth column, you can see pressure rises as high as 36 uh, megapascal per second were obtainable. So this is a good sign and it shows that uh, we have a high heat transfer rate uh, taking place in this, this kind of systems. Uh, however, there was no proper quantification of the, the heat transfer rate occurring in the system. So there was no like a physical number attached to it, which uh, begged the question that whether we could quantify this heat transfer rate so that then we can find then ways of how we improve upon it. So the shortcomings in this data, as I just mentioned to you, is that what they did, this is, these are two different experiments. Both involve uh, a pool of water and you uh, inject a liquid nitrogen jet, which then uh, evaporates quickly. Uh, and uh, so it produces a high pressure. So that would result in uh, converting this uh, stored thermal energy into some uh, useful energy to do some work. Uh, so to quantify the the heat transfer, one of the methods adopted by one of the authors was to look at this core and to assume that it's a cylindrical surface. So I have drawn a, uh, 
a rectangular box in red just to indicate to you uh, how they they assumed a surface area which was a smooth cylinder and arrived at a heat transfer coefficient of around 4 to 25 kilowatt per meter square Kelvin. So this is like a really good heat transfer coefficient. It's uh, very high. Uh, however, if we can clearly see that there are a lot of uh, wavy structures which would uh, which would enhance the heat uh, the surface area for heat exchange. So the the heat transfer coefficient would be slightly lower, uh, or we don't know how, how lower, but it would be lower because I think this is a, a underestimation of the surface area. So because we found that there were previous data were lacking, we decided to set out objectives for the study. And we wanted to know if we could measure heat transfer rates to liquid nitrogen when it's evaporating in another immiscible superheated liquid. So the answer to this was yes. And the solution to solving what others couldn't do was uh, we thought of using our uh, doing experiments with isolated droplets instead of uh, a big jet. And uh, the advantage that this would give us is that if we can isolate a droplet and we can uh, catch its surface area and we can extract such data about its geometry while it's evaporating, then we can quantify its heat transfer rate uh, better. And it would be more accurate, uh, an accurate result compared to previous study. And then we also could uh, go ahead and find out what are the heat transfer rates achievable. Uh, we could also know what were the factors or what were the properties of the fluid or the bulk which were influencing this rate. And the final objective that we had is can we uh, derive or arrive at a model which would help not only us, but it will help uh, people uh, trying to work out similar problems with cryogenic droplets uh, to use uh, a model which would then give them rates and uh, evaporation rates and heat transfer rates. So let me just introduce you to the methodology now. Uh, on the left-hand side is a vacuum insulated drop injector, which I built uh, during my research. And uh, it's got a, a small hold up area on top. And what it has is it's got a vacuum uh, covering here. And it's got a solenoid valve with an electrical feed through, which then goes to a signal generator. So what, what we do is we fill nitrogen and because it's in vacuum insulated, you have the liquid being maintained because we eliminate the convection taking place. So, and the solenoid valve allows us to control and generate a stream of liquid nitrogen droplets. Uh, the, the, the smaller the uh, duration of the signal, that's how we control the droplet breakup. And at the at the bottom, we have attached needles here. So we have created a, a setup where we, are, we have flexibility to change the needle size. Now, this would also help us to control the droplet size as far as we can. So beyond this, there would be some dynamics. And because this is a very cold liquid, there would be some fast evaporation taking place, which would uh, be out of our control as soon as it leaves the needle. But at least till here, we try to control how, how much of liquid we get out of the system and how, what sizes of droplet is created. So with this uh, droplet injector located directly above a test section, if we move to the right, we can see how our uh, system works. So we have an optical system uh, with a test section right in the middle. So we have a glass test section. And this is a glass chamber which has got a high degree of parallelism so that we have uh, the light passing through uh, and not refracting of it. Uh, we then have two cameras which are placed orthogonal to each other. We have uh, light sources, again, orthogonal to each other. And we have a collimating lens to ensure that we try to collimate this light so that we concentrate it into the small region 
where the droplet is uh, uh, going to be present and where it's going to be evaporating. So after we get results and after we get data, uh, the uh, big challenge is how do we reconstruct and how do we post-process this data? So there, we have developed an algorithm which can post-process uh, images obtained from two views. These are, these are both grayscale images. So if we look at the flow diagram, I have two camera, the two camera images. And uh, what I do is I feed them into my algorithm and first I do an edge detection, which then creates a binarized image with uh, edges. But as you can notice, this also produces many false images, which uh, false edges, which you can see within the boundary. So just to, I mean, to make things easier, we have to do a bit of a manual cleanup over here and remove some of these false edges. Then what we do is we feed it into a, algorithm which uh, fits uh, an ellipse based on the randomized hue trans transform. So it fits the ellipse which is uh, which can best approximate the, the bubble structure. And uh, when we have two views, then we and we know that these are both orthogonal planes because we have focused the cameras and made sure that the system is identical. We can now close, we can reconstruct this uh, from two views. And the reason being that is because uh, these are mostly ellipsoidal with an aspect ratio close to unity. And how do we know this is because for all the data sets that we worked with, the bond number was less than a four and the Reynolds number was less than nine. So according to Cliff, uh, in his mapping of uh, fluid structure shapes. Uh, for in this range, you can, uh, the fluid structure would have an ellipsoidal shape with the aspect ratio close to uh, unity. So after we've done this, and after we've got the 3D shape uh, using the alpha shape command, by the way, this uh, whole uh, program is done in MATLAB. So what do we get? We measure parameters like the volume of the droplet, the area of the droplet, the, we can get the volume of the bubble, which is surrounding it, the area of the bubble. And we can derive things like the radius based on the volume and the area. The next thing that we, I would like to introduce you is to a calibration. And it's very important that we calibrate our system very well so that we uh, uh, so that we can accurately estimate all the errors that exist within our methodology and account for them before we can state our results. So we did this by firstly using uh, grade five ceramic balls. So the, the, top, uh, the top two views of are the ceramic balls. So we put a cer ceramic ball right in focus and we clicked images for using our optical system and we reconstructed the shape. Then we did similar things, but this time we did it using the software. So we, we built uh, these uh, uh, geometrical shapes of a prolate ellipse, an angle ellipsoid, and an oblong ellipsoid in, uh, in CAD software to scale. And then we see, saw how we, uh, our reconstruction algorithm works. And uh, what I can say is that it was uh, it worked very well with uh, the error estimated in the volume of uh, less than 2%. However, it doesn't, it shouldn't end over here because we know very well and we knew from experience that sometimes due to this, while the evaporation process proceeds, you have a vapor cloud which is developing and that sometimes spoils the quality of the image in terms of contrast and it creates a very, uh, uh, it's not a clear image as the one I showed you in the slide before. That, that was just a uh, presentation, but sometimes we get uh, images which are uh, not very good quality wise. So to account for that, we decided to change the exposure of uh, the cameras 
and trialed again with these cer ceramic balls. So we reduced the lighting and we then accordingly tested our algorithm for all these exposures. And the worst case scenario is that we get an error of about 6.7%. So just to conclude in the, of the, the methodology part, I wanted to say that the fully analytical reconstruction would always need three views because there may be a bit of a undulations present on one surface, and this is maybe not be captured without a third view. Uh, the error increases as the aspect ratio of the ellipsoid reduces. And uh, one more thing that we have uh, grossly overestimated is that we've considered the object to be smooth, which may not be true because it may be wavy. Now let me come to the results. So the first results uh, that uh, we have here is a typical evaporation process. So if I look at the figure A, it's a nitrogen droplet leaving the injector and it's trying to, pay, I mean, just before it can get, impact the surface of the bulk liquid. Or, uh, then in the second case, it has already impacted the bulk and it's now uh, evaporating. So there is a vapor core there. What happens is that some of this liquid then penetrates through the bulk while the rest of it is just uh, the, the surface uh, rebounds and the rest of it is rejected. So as a result, we have a droplet now uh, in C, but it's, it, this is the, at the moment just before it can detach. In D, you can see that in a very short time, it immediately leads to such a structure where you have a droplet engulfed by a vapor structure, so a bubble which is growing in size as the droplet keeps getting heated and losing mass. As this bubble grows in size, it gets more buoyant and move to, moves towards the surface, as we can see in uh, figure E. And at some po point in time, when the buoyancy forces are large enough, as well as due to the draining of the liquid film at the interface, the bubble will face a pressure imbalance and it will collapse. And uh, upon this collapse, we see that if the internal, the engulfed droplet is uh, large enough such that its uh, gravity is strong enough, it will remain immersed even though the bubble has collapsed. It will just start off the, operate, the, the same process again, this time by starting a, a new uh, bubble generator around it. So this is the typical process, evaporation process. And uh, typical evaporation times, what we have encountered are uh, around 200 milliseconds, sometimes more than that. Uh, now I would like to just uh, show you uh, a small, a short video on one of the one of the uh, experimental uh, uh, experiments that I captured. Yeah, so this is a liquid nitrogen droplet. It's evaporating in a propanol, or you can say it's isopropanol. At uh, at room temperature, so at at the lab at which we were working, it was around uh, 21 degrees Celsius or 294 Kelvin. So you can clearly see this droplet here and this uh, double interface structure of a droplet within engulfed by a bubble, a growing bubble, and you can also see how it gets clouded, cloudy with time as more. Uh, vapors generated. So 
it's uh, it's still growing although it's uh, it's going out of view but uh, and here it collapses and as you can see the droplet was heavy enough so it remained immersed and another vapor bubble formed around it yeah so after the evaporation process let's uh, proceed to see what are the major results so we we gathered data and we have plotted them in terms of bubble growth rate because bubble growth rates uh, would uh, be de determine basically the evaporation rate of liquid of the liquid nitrogen droplet so we have four graphs over here uh, plotting the evaporation rates of liquid nitrogen droplets in four different liquids so we have uh, tried them with uh, propanol, methanol, pentane, and hexane. And uh, the reason why we chose these liquids is firstly because they were they had a low nitrogen had a low miscibility in these liquids. Secondly, these liquids have a low surface tension. Thirdly, these liquids have low density, so it was easier for us to penetrate the nitrogen droplet into these liquids rather than water which is uh, uh, denser than liquid nitrogen so the the range of uh, sizes that we have trialed with uh, the droplet sizes range from 60 to 340 microns whereas the bubbles that we obtained uh, and these were growing bubbles so between 350 to 2000 microns so uh, a radius of a uh, maximum radius of up to two uh, millimeters what we obtained and from the plots from these plots of raw data the major thing that we can conclude is that the initial droplet size that means if there's a larger droplet injected it would lead to a higher growth uh, a larger growth and a higher growth rate Uh, the next, what we wanted to do is we wanted to see what is the impact of different forces on this bubble growth rate and why, uh, what are the uh, forces, uh, what is the effect of the relative forces. So uh, what we have here is the classical Rayleigh-Plessé equation for a bubble growth in a superheated liquid. And uh, in our case, we have a slight difference because we have uh, the 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 bubble is growing due to vapor added internally rather than externally. So, but uh, it, it was nevertheless, we could still use this to see what was the impact of the forces of the bulk on the liquid. So the first two terms are the inertial force uh, terms and the next two are the viscous terms and the final one is the, uh, the capillary terms. And this plot clearly conveys to us that the capillary terms are or at least one or an order of magnitude higher than the, the remaining two terms. And uh, it tells us that this uh, for nitrogen droplets growing, uh, the growing bubble size, uh, hence the evaporation rate is controlled by the surface tension which the bubble has with the bulk liquid. The next thing what we wanted to do is from the I showed you the raw data, but uh, it would not it wasn't making sense because there was just curves which showing different kind of uh, slopes and different uh, trajectories. So we had to find a scaling uh, and we had to scale our data to show how the, the droplet behavior is uh, while it's it's growing this bubble. So we scale. Uh, and the the scaling was derived by firstly assuming that this droplet evaporation follows uh, a standard d square type of model where the evaporation rate is uh, proportional to the square of the diameter and uh, what we then obtained is 
an expression which you can see number two here. So what we see is the 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 relative change in the bubble size with respect to the volume of the initial volume of the droplet, and it's a function of uh, kappa. And this kappa basically depends on the parameters of the vapor within the bubble. So when we plot it and we plot all our data, what we see is kappa is much lower. And uh, one of the reasons why we can uh, say that kappa is lower is because in our case, we have a droplet which is mobile. So it's not sitting right at the center and it's not a, a concentric kind of a symmetrical kind of model which you, we which the d square law uses so because we have this uh, droplet uh, moving around it is always changing the temperature profile within the within the bubble so this would lead to an enhanced kind of evaporation and for that we had to do a fitting and what we find is that if you put a factor of four, that is kappa, equal, kappa dash equals to four times kappa, we get a very good uh, fit uh, and we get a very good scaling. And this, uh, the shaded region that I show, it represents a 30% deviation and it covers most of our data in there, except for pentane, one of the bulk fluids, pentane. And uh, the reason for this could be that among all the fluids that we trialed, pentane had a very low surface tension. So, and as I told you in the previous slide, the surface tension is one is the major uh, factor which controls the bubble growth. So this could be the reason why pentane doesn't follow the behavior. But nevertheless, it's a good result to see that uh, three of the fluids at least confirm to this kind of a scaling analysis. The next what we wanted to do is we wanted to uh, derive a model and we wanted to have a simplified model as a first guess. So what we have here is a, a model which uh, assumes that there is a quasi steady temperature profile developed. Uh, it's, a, it's a model which assumes that the droplet is concentrically located within the bubble. We ignore the viscous and inertial forces. We also assume that the, there's uniform pressure within the bubble. That means uh, as soon as the, you have nitrogen evaporating uh, out of the droplet, it uh, uniformly distributes itself into the bubble. There is no mass transfer across the bubble boundary, and uh, there is no convective heating within the bubble. So the, the last one is uh, a bit of uh, it's not a very good assumption to make, and I'll, I'll explain later why we had to, uh, why we were proved wrong with this assumption. So some of the major equations are here listed in this slide. It's, uh, I wouldn't go into detail because it's just the, the radial profile, temperature profile, and uh, we can now use the, the Young-Laplace equation for uh, calculating the pressure of the bubble because we know that uh, the other terms are uh, negligible and surface tension is the major term. And when we differentiate, we can then compute the uh, change in the radius of the bubble with time. So going to the results of our model, we have plotted the results for all the four uh, bulk liquids that we experimented with. And if I can just uh, draw your attention to plot number, the, the A, the figure A. And uh, what you see here is that for our model, if you look at the lowest line, which is below which is written the pure conductive limit. So that was our model predicting prediction against experimental data. And it was fine because it was making sense. Uh, the prediction was, uh, if you look at the figure of the bubble and the droplet shown, the prediction of the pure conductive limit was when the droplet is located at number one, when the droplet is in the center. 
However, we know that the droplet is going to be at number two, not during its entire lifetime, but during some part of its lifetime. So it's going to be moving around. Sometimes it may be towards the center. Sometimes it may be in the closer to the boundary. So if we put the droplet closer to the boundary and we consider this small vapor film uh, here between the droplet, what we then get is the, we get a, the Leiden frost limit. So we can compute the evaporation rate and the growth rate using our same uh, model, which I explained in the previous slide. And you can see that it's highly overestimating if you consider that the uh, droplet is at the boundary very close to the bubble surface throughout its lifetime. So the actual uh, results were somewhere in between. And for that, to account for this mobility of the droplet, as well as the convection effects which take place here within the bubble, we had to assign, again, a factor, which so we called it a K effective. And this was uh, 1.6 times the thermal conductivity of nitrogen. And what we find is that when we assign this K effective, we get uh, good results and they are, they are a good match with experimental data. So using the SCA effective, now the I would call it a tuned model, tuned simplified one dimensional model. We then start to compute heat transfer rates and we match them with experimental data. So to, to compute uh, experimentally heat transfer rates, we use equation six, which considers the change in the bubble uh, volume with respect to change in time. And it uh, divides this with the surface area of the droplet. What we can see from these curves is that it predicts the trend very well. However, the data experimentally is also quite scattered. But nevertheless, the trend is being predicted, uh, which is a good first start, I would say. And if we average and find out uh, what is the average heat uh, flux, uh, what we get is around 25 watt per centimeter square. And this figure that we get is uh, it's significantly higher than the pool boiling of uh, nitrogen at this temperature difference, which is around six watt per centimeter square. Uh, and in the bracket, what I've given you is the heat flux, which is around one kilowatt per meter square Kelvin. The reason I've given this figure is just to compare with what previous uh, authors had predicted based on their jet structure by assuming a cell cylinder. And we can see how they had over predicted heat uh, transfer rates. So all the experiments I covered before were all done when the fluid was maintained at the lab temperature, that is the bulk fluid liquid was maintained at the lab temperature. However, we started to then investigate uh, experiments done in a similar way, but this time by heating the bulk liquid to temperatures uh, ab to about 40 degrees Celsius. So we uh, had a bunch of experiments done, and here I have I've put two of the results here. One is liquid nitrogen evaporating in uh, methanol and the other one is in pentane. So if you look at the first uh, figure, you can see for a similar droplet size and the same bulk temperature, we have a very similar growth rate pattern, uh, the green. And in the red, you can see if you have an increased bulk temperature, you do gain. And uh, if you go to the left hand, uh, the right uh, hand figure, figure B, you see that if you have an increased bulk temperature plus a larger droplet, you would have the maximum uh, rise in the, the growth rate of the bubble. So we can uh, conclude that for bulk temperatures uh, in the range we investigated, a higher temperature provides a faster evaporation. Now, uh, I would like to make an uh, end here by stating uh, major conclusions that have come out of this presentation. 
And the first question, the question that we asked right at the start is, the answer to that is yes, cryogenic liquids can be exploited for energy systems via the direct injection approach. However, the evaporation rate is not fast enough for engine cycles, which require to the tune of uh, somewhere around 10 or so few uh, tens of milliseconds. Rather, we can get evaporation happening in a time period of hundreds of milliseconds. The experimental methodology which was developed can be used uh, very well to visualize and quantify the evaporation process. And we can also quantify the heat transfer rates. Uh, now these rates which we have quantified are also applicable to a spray of cryogenic uh, droplets uh, because the ultimate goal would be to use a spray of droplets because that would give you really the, the extra force that you need to produce, not, not just single isolated droplets. And uh, we've derived a scaling law, which is good because this scaling law now takes into account the relative size of the droplet initially injected and then scales all the data. Because a smaller droplet makes a different, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, so evaporation rate and a larger droplet has a different kind of growth rate. And lastly, we have developed a simplified quasi steady state model and then we've tuned it with an effective thermal conductivity. Uh, it was quite successful as a first step to, cor uh, to correct the droplet mobility within the vapor bubble. However, I would not say it is a complete model and Definitely more work can be done on this to uh, compute the uh, or to take into account the complex movement of the droplet within the within the vapor, the growing vapor bubble. Well, before I could conclude, I would just like to acknowledge uh, my funders, Loughborough University and the Dearman Engine Company, uh, my supervisors, uh, Professor Zhao, Professor Garner and uh, Dr. Williams. Uh, my collaborator, Dr. Francois Nadal. Uh, I, if anybody is interested, I would say the two, this, the book by Mark Stevenson, We Do Things Differently, chapter five and six, is uh, stories on how the Dearman engine has evolved and what are its future applications. And chapter six is more related to liquid uh, air energy storage. So they cover more or less Dearman and Highview Power, the two companies that I mentioned. And uh, it's just a suggestion if you would be interested in reading more on this. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Neville. That was uh, really good. Um, quite a complex topic, but um, it's uh, nice, clear um, descriptions and. Um, kept um kept the interest going with with all the details um thank you for that we've got uh, one question um but so while i'm talking other people can still type other questions if they have any um this is from hisham Udin. apologies i've said that right um you call liquid nitrogen um a zero emissions energy source while this may be the case for emissions from the engine exhaust separating and liquefying nitrogen is a very energy intensive process. Has an emission study of the whole value chain been done? How? Uh, well, there have been a lot of studies being done. Uh, I, I do not uh, call liquid nitrogen a zero energy uh, source uh, when we uh, just use it for the purpose of uh, uh, extracting its energy. Uh, the reason why I said it's zero energy uh, source is because of the regasification process and the demand which you require for nitrogen. There is a similar case being made for LNG where you transport LNG through massive tankers from the source of production to the destination. Uh, and at the destination side, you just regasify it uh, with the, sometimes with the ambient air and you uh, you just lose all this cold. So uh, we are not making the case of a zero emissions uh, uh, source over here. We are just making the case that there is a cold 
energy storage reserve which is being uh, sometimes being wasted and uh, could be utilized and if we if we work out proper systems on how we can utilize this thank you um another question um there's quite a few so i'll try and just pick a few out um if the liquid nitrogen is not suitable for engine systems can't it be used for other energy systems where cooling is essential yes uh so uh well uh, as i as i mentioned to you the two companies uh if you look at the first company which is dearman what they do is uh they 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 are involved in uh, storage the cold chain uh so what they do is they are currently using their engine on refrigeration trucks and they are uh, uh, what they do is uh, the, the their engine basically drives the refrigeration system of the truck it doesn't drive the truck and at the same time it produces cooling as well so it's got double benefits whereas what high view is trying to do is the high view is trying to use uh, excess uh, uh, power available in the grid to liquefy air and store this air and when there is demand excess demand it then uh, heats up this air and produces some uh, power by expanding this uh, pressurized uh, air into a turbine so there are ways in which people are trying to harness this uh, energy and it's not necessarily for engines only so it's got a lot of scope uh, when i say scope uh, i think we still these technologies are still in a developmental phase so there we've got a long way to go but uh, the interesting thing is that the the storage and the transportation and the handling of the cryogens is something which is well established and standardized so those are some things which we can use to our advantage when you compare it with uh, other energy systems like stored hydro energy which sometimes you need to uh, survey land you need to have a lot of uh, land available you need to build a dam which can be uh, challenging and it it requires a lot of hurdles uh, compared to this kind of uh, technology. Thank you. That question was from uh, Olawale Kute. Um, another question. Um, when you say, this is from Howard W, when you say heat transfer isn't quick enough for engine cycles, is that for piston engines? Uh, uh, yes, I would say uh, I was referring to piston engines because well, uh, the typical uh, time that you get is around, what, 10 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds of that order. So I was referring to piston engines. However, uh, we are still looking at some aspects of heat transfer, uh, which may apply or may not apply to cryogenic liquids because cryogenic liquids are usually, uh, the, the temperature difference between them and the atmosphere is so, large that they come in the, under what we call as the film boiling regime uh, however there is a, a, a regime slightly uh, below that where we can exploit for such high evaporation rates and that is a it's a different uh, topic to consider thank you um here's quite a specific one um wouldn't the needle diameter have an impact on the droplet size characteristics. Why yes. needle? Why that length? And this is from Umar Farooq Khan. Well, uh, the the needle size does have a does have a uh, uh, effect on the droplet uh, characteristics, and we try as much as possible. Uh, initially, we tried to use very sm uh, needles with very small orifices because we were trying to generate uh, the smallest possible droplet that we could simply because it could be captured uh, within our depth of field. We just do not want the droplet to disappear out of view. Uh, however, there is a balance that you have to throw in because uh, when the droplet leaves the needle, uh, that's when it's uh, interacting with air. 
Secondly, uh, when it touches the surface, immediately when it impacts, sometimes if it's a large bulky droplet, when it squishes against the surface, it immediately evaporates and this produces a vapor layer which uh, is buoyant and resists its mo movement into the liquid. So many times it was a failure and we did not get droplets penetrating in rather than bouncing off the surface and out. Okay. Um, and Said uh, Yadav asks, can we use this process in cryogenic machining? Does it help to decrease the wastage of liquid nitrogen in machining? <laughs> well, uh, yes. I would say uh, at the end of my thesis, I have suggested a few applications where this could be used. Uh, machining was something we did not consider, but we were considering of freezing of foods. That is your your pizzas and your uh, all your frozen potatoes and all that you get in the supermarket. These are mostly uh, frozen by liquid nitrogen. Uh, many of you may be knowing because there's a drop, there's a doser a dosing system which injects a small short uh, dose of liquid nitrogen and that quickly freezes it and then they package it. So if we can control that. This research will help uh, such uh, food uh, processing, uh, manufacture uh, food processing uh, industry to uh, co uh, conserve liquid nitrogen and make sure they don't, they don't overdo things because right now they don't have any. Uh, with uh, during some of my conversations with some of the companies, I know that they do not follow any guidelines. They just uh, they just follow experience and pour a, a jet from the dosing system. Thank you. And just one last question um, from Ian Borthwick. If you had used a long vertical pipe and injected the droplet at the bottom, would you have had less difficulty in establishing bubble shape? <laughs> well, uh, we, uh, we, we, we considered injecting the droplet from the bottom. Uh, it's very challenging with a cryogenic droplet. Uh, firstly, because uh, there, there's always heat and leak. So uh, when it comes to cryogenics, however much you try to insulate the system, there's always heat and leak. And uh, this was this creates a challenge in itself because uh, first of all, you have a very small orifice and you want to inject a very tiny droplet. Uh, so when you do that, you basically, uh, by the time it reaches the bottom and it's exposed to a relatively hot fluid, you get mostly some either some vapor coming out or in some cases you have the uh, the bulk liquid entering the uh, the needle and not resulting in a uh, good experiment so we had to give up that uh, thought of uh, injecting from the bottom okay thank you very much neville um hopefully that's uh, answered most people's questions sorry that, that i know it hasn't uh, on some people's second questions, but um, um, yes, yeah, so as the notes will, the slides will all be available on the iMeki YouTube channel, and you'll receive them. Um, you'll have a link to them um, after this um, this is finished. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your time, Neville. I know it's um, uh, uh, you've put a lot of effort in, and um, really appreciate um, all your uh, preparation for this. Um, mm -hmm. But it's been uh, really interesting, and um, we've had a good turnout, so it, that shows the interest we've had in it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you very much, and um, thank you for IMECI headquarters, Emma, and everyone for um, organising this. And um, finally, thank you to all our attendees. Yeah, thank you. All right.